afternoon, everyone. I will start the seminar. Yeah. Our guest today is Professor Tomek Bully. And Tomek uh, is a specialist in gravitational waves. He studied theoretical physics at Warsaw University. And he did PhD in astrophysics in Penn State University in the US. Habilitated at Copernicus Center in 2001 specializing in the neutron star physics, and he became full professor in 2009, works at Warsaw University Astronomical Observatory since uh, 2019. He's a member of the Science Excellence uh, Board for the ministry, and since 2020, he's a corresponding member of the Polish Academy of Science, and he has been president of the Astronomy Committee of the Polish Academy of Science. So welcome, we are honored to Thanks have you here and listen to your talk about the origin of gravitational waves. Yes. Uh, we have now observed uh, quite a number of uh, sources in gravitational waves, and these are coalescing binaries. And on this plot, you see the effective four-dimensional time space surveyed by uh, gravitational wave uh, observatories, uh, and then the cumulative number of detections as a function of this four-dimensional uh, volume, so that's volume times time. Uh, and this number grows nicely, steadily. The, the BNS is binary neutron star, so uh, this is the binary neutron star volume. Uh, so that's assuming the mass of the sources is uh, 1.4, 1.4 solar masses, uh, because the range of gravitational wave uh, experiment depends uh, like mass in a pow power of about uh, 0.8. Anyway, uh, so, so it, you have to assume some mass to, to, to get this volume. So we now have uh, 300, uh, 100 detections, and uh, since one year, there was another uh, observational run that uh, was quite successful, but I am not at liberty to tell more about that until it's published. But this curve, I can assure you, is going up and down. So with 100 detections, you can start doing statistics. You can start considering what are the uh, properties of the sources, and I think in X-ray astronomy or gamma-ray astronomy in the old times, there was a saying that one photon is a detection, two photons are a spectrum, and three photons is a spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. And now we have 100 <laughs> sources, so we can do much more than that. So what are the, uh, what can we detect? What, uh, so we, what, what can be measured for each source? So one main parameter, that we can measure is the chirp mass. And that is the combination of masses that you see here. Uh, we can uh, measure the total mass and the mass ratio, but with uh, poorer accuracy. We can measure two quantities that are rela related to black hole spins. One is called the effective spin and, and another is called the effective precession. And we can measure statistical properties like rates or uh, <clears throat> densities of this uh, object. So uh, with uh, chirp mass and mass ratio, we can get the individual masses. Uh, and uh, we can start with the individual masses plot here. Uh, so one, so these are the objects we see in gravitational waves. And for each merger, you see a line. Uh, one component, another component, and the final component. The final component mass is a little bit less than the sum of the masses because there is plenty of energy emitted in gravitational uh, waves. But uh, the point here is that the bulk of the sources have uh, has masses in the range of about uh, 15 to 50 solar masses, uh, which is a little bit higher than we used to see in X-ray binaries where typical black hole masses are of the order of five to 10 solar masses. Uh, and the, the question was, is this a selection effect or is, are this, is this a different population? What is the 
what is the point here, what's happening here. Then uh, for the primary mass, we see that that's the fit, that these are fits to the distribution of the mass. Uh, and in this uh, fits, you see the, uh, you see several uh, of the peaks, but generally, you know, depending on the model that you uh, that you assume, you get uh, a different fit. So you can assume just a simple fall off. But where are the data points? It's hard to see. There's no data points. There is no data points okay. here. So so this has been the and uh, you you do you assume a model, and then you do maximum likelihood to get the best. So this is the, population synthesis output, basically. Well, no, this, this is observations. Observation. Okay. Observations. Uh, so the point is that there is evidence that there are there is some structure in this spectrum. Uh, what is so there is this peak around 30 something, there is maybe a peak here, but not uh, very certain. And generally the the <coughs> Uh, the spectrum of the masses falls off towards higher values. And if you see that this is linear scale, this is log scale, so this falls off exponentially. But it stretches to about 100, where, where the highest uh, masses of the primary components were uh, detected. Then we have the effective spin. And the effective spin is, uh, is the mass-weighted average of the individual black hole spins projected onto the direction of the angular momentum of the, of the binary. Mm -hmm. So this quantity can be between plus unity and minus unity. If the two spins are aligned, we, this, this is plus unity, if they're anti-aligned, it's minus unity. If you assume that these values were uh, unities, but different directions, you will get a distribution that is a triangle uh, between minus one and one. Uh, but that's no, that's what we have to deal with. And th th this can be measured pretty accurately. But then there is the precession spin, which is connected with the uh, value, that's this value. It's, uh, so it's connected with the value of the spins uh, in the uh, direction in the plane of the of the orbit, and this value is uh, very poorly measured. So I just mentioned it that it, it is there, but we we cannot say a lot about the, 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 the distribution. It's just theta angle that is between the spin vector. Yeah, that's the theta is this. Uh, so uh, what is the distribution of these values? So for the effective spin. We have the distribution that is peaked at slightly positive values, and its width is about plus minus 0.02, which means that spins tend to be slightly on the average, but not for every individual system, aligned with the angular momentum. But again, to be fair, this is Bayesian reconstruction from the data. No, this, are, uh, this is an average of all the events. All the events. And so, every event has just one number, right? Effective. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, but for, for each of them, you get a probability distribution. That's what I mean. So, there's still Bayesian mechanism to get this curve here. Mm, but the prior, so, so are you referring to what priors were used? Priors were, were uninformative. So, this. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I just wanted to know. So, so yeah. yeah. Uh, so here you see essentially this grayish things are the uh, <clears throat> plots for uh, all, all of the individual systems, and then there is a distribution of all of these quantities. For the perpendicular spin, this value is also concentrated over on about 0.2, which means that the spins are slightly aligned with the uh, angular momentum, and they are not maximal. The typical black holes that we observe have spins of the order of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, maybe 0.3, but these are not maximal, maximally rotating black holes with the spins of 0.9 or, or, or 1. So spins are small in this, but not very small, it's uh, not zero, but uh, not, not maximal. 
Then rates versus redshift. Uh, we see that uh, this blue line shows the estimate of the rate density of in this, this units per gigaparsec cube per year as a function of the redshift. And just to guide your eye and just to make you believe that, it's <laughs> that there is a relation, uh, there is the dashed line, which is uh, uh, the shape of the star formation rate history as a function of redshift. Uh, so this shows that these two curves are consistent with another. It doesn't prove anything, but at least it shows that there is some uh, that, that if we expect a relation, the, 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 there seems to be a relation between the that there might be a relation. It's not inconsistent with being related to star formation rate history. And this is the uh, star formation rate history as a function of redshift, but going to much higher redshift. So we essentially probe this part with the gravitational wave so far. Yes. If you don't have to the second wave. Mm -hmm. So, but there's also ethic here, just related to expansion of the universe because there's a background density of the gas that goes down with expansion. So it is, because it's a, it's a, it's a normalized moving volume, right? Per yes. year, right. So do you take this into account? Or maybe you should expect this, this correlation because of the fact that the expansion has some, some uniform form. Number density, uh, sorry, the density of gas goes down, so star formation goes down also. No, but this goes up. I mean, uh... right, right, but it goes down with the redshift. So, in... ah, okay. Uh, I mean, but uh, so this is per co moving gigaparsec yeah. cube. Uh, but really, it's not obvious why it should be redshift too. So, so, I mean, these two quantities no, are, are... The... no, but these two quantities are calculated in the same units. Yeah, per, 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 so these are solar, uh, not, not the same units, this solar masses per year per megaparsec cube. This is number per gigaparsec cube per year. So, okay, yeah. so uh, what I'm saying is that these two curves follow roughly the same pattern. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then black. So, what are the main challenges to make these systems? What is what do we have to uh, solve? First is the black hole mass challenge. I mentioned that the masses of these objects are uh, typically uh, higher than observed in uh, X-ray binaries. So, uh, one thing is that the black hole masses in uh, stellar evolution are uh, limited by per instability supernova, and they have different uh, abbreviations for that use throughout this talk. Uh, but essentially, this means that once uh, you have a massive star with a massive core, and in this massive core, the temperature is uh, high enough so that you can start. Uh, producing pairs from photons. That is a catastrophic news for a star because instead of two nice photons that have high momentum and provide a lot of pressure, you suddenly have two, uh, an electron and positron pair with, which have little momentum and provide little pressure. And therefore, the, this leads to, uh, well, depending on the mass that can lead to uh, oscillations of a star, but uh, simulations show that for about for, for stars that would form that would that have uh, black holes uh, of the order of 65, 70 solar masses, if they if they are more massive, then the star is disrupted, and we do not uh, form uh, them at all. And here you see the black expected black hole mass as a function of the initial stellar mass for different values of st solar winds. You can also understand the solar winds as different metallicity, different uh, chemical composition. So if a, if a star is uh, poorer in chemical elements, the winds will be lower, and then you can produce uh, more massive uh, black holes. For uh, the environment, like in our galaxy, we are stuck with uh, this <clears throat> curve, and we produce mo mostly less massive black holes in a uh, in an environment with solar uh, metallicity. So, in order to make black holes above that, you have to invoke something else 
beyond the uh, mechanism of just stellar evolution. Then there is the black hole spin challenge because black hole spins in gravitational wave sources are small and black hole spins in accreting binaries are large. So, uh, I mean, but there is a very, few, this is an exceptional uh, category of objects that's not a generic, we, that's easy to observe, but uh, from the population point of view, these are not your everyday black holes. So uh, I think that there are two arguments that uh, say that the that black hole spins in, a, in the, when they form from the stars should be small. And the arguments are as follows. The first one, is, okay, so these are the black hole spins in accreting stars. So that's the distribution. This is the spin. This is the distribution. There is lots of them uh, here with uh, high spins, and well, there are some with low spins. So that's the model distribution. So the idea is that if you look at <clears throat> other objects that form similarly, for which we can measure the spins or rotation rates which are young neutron stars. And if you choose the young neutron stars that have uh, low age and for which you can estimate the kinematic age uh, quite well, you can trace their uh, spins back to the time that they uh, were formed. And you can find the uh, distribution of initial periods of young neutron stars. So for young neutron stars, typical periods are given here. They peak at about 0.2 seconds. And 0.2 seconds for a neutron star is an extremely slow rotation. Fast rotation is like one millisecond. Uh, another way to estimate the initial spins of neutron stars is from energetics of pulsar wind nebula. So if neutron stars were born with very high spins, they would lose the energy and inject this energy into pulsar wind nebula, and we would see a lot more energy uh, being uh, radiated from the young pulsar uh, wind uh, nebula. So neutron stars typically rotate very slowly after they are formed. Mm -hmm. So if there is any connection between uh, or any if formation, the, the angular momentum which is in the uh, in the star in the host uh, so, so in the star uh, before the collapse has to be somehow. Well, so the, yeah, yeah, the, 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 that means that the exactly that the this huge amount of angular momentum that could be concentrated in the newly formed compact object somehow is removed. How it is happening, I don't know, but uh, here is. And the second argument comes from GRBs. If you look at uh, supernovae, you know, how many supernovae are there in the universe per second? Uh, the rate is about one per second, one hertz. So, and if you uh, see what is the rate density, the number uh, of uh, gamma ray bursts in the universe, uh, when you collect for beaming, it's about one per hundred seconds, about uh, maybe a few hundred seconds. So GRBs uh, happen to be like, like every 100 or 1,000 uh, um, supernova. And in order to make a GRB, you need a quickly spinning black hole inside a star to make jets and to plunge jets through the star and to make the GRB engine. So but in this in this estimate you take into account do you take into account that uh, the GRB emission is directional? So yes, that's yeah, beaming. That's that's that's, that's, that's a, so that I mean in the in the so typically we observe if we observe the entire sky we observe about three GRBs per day, but so so about a hundred per. Uh, uh, per year, mm -hmm. uh, but if we collect it for, you know, the, uh, the, the and then uh, when you collect it for the beaming, which is about a factor of a hundred, that gives you th this this estimate. So uh, if the are caused, if uh, if, so, so yeah, if GRBs. Uh, yeah, that should be spinning. <laughs> That's a funny mistake. Simple stars. Yes. Uh, 
So if GRBs are caused by spinning black holes, then most uh, black holes are not born spinning because uh, we would see many more GRBs. So that's my other argument. Yeah. Then there is the uh, initial separation challenge because in order to put two black holes on an orbit so close that they will merge in Hubble time, you have to like for two, for, for the 30, 30 solar mass binary, you, they need to be about less than 30 solar radii apart. The radius of a 30 solar mass star is 10 uh, solar radii. So uh, this system, if, that was, if these stars were originating and all of the mass collapsed mm -hmm. to black holes, mm -hmm. they would already be feeling the row slopes and they would be in contact. But these stars, these black holes must originate in much more massive stars. And to add insult to injury, they would, over their evolution, the radii will go uh, and will be much larger. They, they may be reaching about a, a thousand uh, solar radii. So you have to squeeze the system to put the two black holes very close, much closer than the initial separation of the, uh, of the stars. So this is like mass radius and, uh, on the main sequence for uh, for, for, for stars. Uh, then uh, another uh, fact is the um, merger rate density. The, for binary black holes, we estimate that the mergers, uh, merger rate density is about 20 to 45 per gigaparsec cube per year. And no, the, the question is, so, so what? Is it a lot? Is it not a lot? You have to compare it with something. But it, why, why is the universal fine? Obviously, the right that's local. That's local. Well, that's zero. Okay. Yeah. For the, for the uh, so uh, we talk about local quantities. Local supernova rate. If we have uh, one galaxy per hundred megaparsec cube, and we have one supernova per hundred years, then this is ten to the five per gigaparsec cube per year. Then assuming that one in ten supernova make a black hole, then the black hole formation rate is about 10 to the 4. So this rate on top is less than 1% of that. And I'm saying that this is a lot, because if you want to make, uh, you know, put black holes in binaries and uh, put them into binary black holes, do not disrupt the systems and make them into tight binaries so that they will merge in the Hubble time, putting 1% of all the black holes in such binaries is quite a challenge. So this rate is quite high. This is five two supernova frequency, right? Because you're talking about type two, type one, yeah. type one is so massive. Is it not that high still? I thought type two are much less, uh, more rare than type ones. Uh, no, this is like this is type two. Yeah. Okay, well, just to make sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but typically stars when they form, they usually form in, in binary yeah. systems or, or triples. So half of the stars are actually born in binary. Yes, so but you but you have to make sure that this binary survives all of the uh, troubles until it gets to make a binary black hole, and it's very easy. <laughs> Uh, not to make one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so about one black hole in a hundred to a thousand ends up in a in a magic binary. So we have to we have to keep it in in mind. Uh, so the, the to to sum up these challenges, black hole masses and spins. Uh, I think this is not a real problem. We can go up to 65 solar masses, but when we go beyond 65, 70 solar masses, we have to start uh, worrying. Um, orbital separation to merge in Hubble time, it needs some work and I'll show, show you how to uh, get the systems so close, how to get the black holes so close. Uh, and the rate says that it, there is quite uh, a lot of them. So now, what models do we have? Uh, we have stellar models, which are based on binary evolution. So there can be evolution in the field, in the galaxies. 
uh, there is a, there are some variants like chemically homogeneous evolution where we allow the stars to rotate very quickly and mix their compo composition, which makes the radii not expand too much. Uh, then uh, people consider population three stars. Then there is the cluster evolution where you evolve stars in globular clusters, and that adds more degree of freedom because you can have co have um, collisions between systems, you can exchange partners, and you can tighten binaries by uh, interaction with other uh, systems. And these collisions in the very dense systems happen very often. Then there is AGM disk model, which I don't uh, think is very is a very good one because I think it provides very low rate and primordial black holes, which have their own problems, which I'll talk about later. So generally, you start, you know, if you want to calculate the properties in a given model, stellar model, you start with star formation rate. You start with a uh, star formation rate that is a function of metallicity. And that's a very nice result from Martina Hruszlińska, uh, who uh, calculated based on measurements, uh, the uh, metallicity as a function of redshift map of the of the universe and you see that the metallicity which affects the masses of the black holes uh, is not a one to one function of the cosmic time cosmic history uh, there is a quite wide distribution of metallicities and you can have uh, high metallicities uh, at uh, high redshifts and you can have low metallicities at uh, low redshifts so you, you evolve these systems at their own metallicities and uh, you let them uh, form binaries, wait until they in spiral and merge and then uh, gravitational wave, waves travel and you see the detection. So that's the process you have to model to get the, uh, the rays and uh, to find the, uh, the properties. Uh, so, let me uh, now come to uh, details of each of these um, scenarios. So in the isolated binary evolution, the masses must come from stellar evolution. There is no, uh, no way of exchanging partners. So here we have this uh, per instability maximum of 60, 70 solar masses. And uh, going beyond that, I mean, some people are trying, we're trying to extend the, the limit, but you know, the more you extend it, the less probable it gets. So uh, I, I, I think that this are very- It's not very metallicity dependent, not like this. Okay. It's, it's not very, very metallicity dependent, very metallic. no, no. <laughs> uh, then we know that effective spins should be in, uh, there are reasons to make the effective spins aligned with the, I mean, slightly positive uh, because of uh, mass transfers and the mass transfers from a star onto a black hole uh, tends to align spin with the angular momentum of the, of the spin. Uh, then uh, we see that the spins <coughs> Uh, can be small, but uh, if we and, and you know we can change the uh, direction of the spin slightly, but we do not increase the spins uh, very much. And if we have mass transfers in this type of systems, massive systems, then the time scales for the mass transfer is very low. And then the main element of such a uh, scenario is when you have this first star that forms a black hole and you have a second star that is still a star, it starts to transfer mass onto the black hole. And this transfer is from a more massive, uh, very evolved star to a lower, lower mass black hole. This mass transfer is unstable because in such a case, the system shrinks, the orbit shrinks and that, uh, and the, the black holes is engulfed by the envelope of this uh, system. And we believe that uh, the, a good description of this mass transfer is such that the uh, envelope of the star is 
ejected at the expense of the orbital uh, energy, and you end up with a system that used to be wide and starts to be quite tight. So that's the magic that is supposed to bring the two uh, objects very close, much closer than the initial orbital separation. And uh, then this uh, core of the accreting star makes another black hole and you have binary black hole in spiral. So the system doesn't go through some uh, common envelope. So that's, that, that's, that's, the, that's, right? the, that's the common envelope. That's the common. Yeah, so this is the common envelope for, uh, part that should uh, should help us make the system tight and allow us to make a merging system. Can you also say about eccentricity? It began from quite large zero mm -hmm. four, and then... I mean the zero four was that's initial. Th then it was circularized in the first mass transfer when the more massive tra star started to evolve, and uh, that leads to uh, mass loss and uh, mass ratio reversal, but during this first mass transfer, the eccentricity is lost. Mm -hmm. Then you can gain some eccentricity if there is asymmetry and there is some mass lost in the uh, supernova, in, in the collapse. Mm -hmm. Here we assume that there is very little mass loss, so there is little eccentricity gained, but uh, if we lose more mass, we can get more eccentricity. Maybe, of course, the exchange happens due to the energy, the orbital energy. But what happens on the momentum? Then black holes need to spin up, then, I guess. If... Here? Yes. So, so the no, 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 no. I mean, the, this, this, okay, this phase takes a few years. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. So uh, there is no time to agree. Even if you agree to the adding generate or super adding okay. generate. Mm -hmm. You agree to this? It's in the Yeah. And okay. um, the point is that a lot of mass is simply shredded away from this. Yes. Yes. Very mm -hmm. yes okay. Yeah. And the, and the point is that we observe systems like this, where you see a black hole and a helium star. Uh, the, and the black hole is accreting. Uh, from the wind of the helium star. So, and, and the, the, the systems are on very tight through something like that. Thank you. Yeah. So, related question uh, what, is, what is the time scale from the top to bottom for this type of thing? For this type of, this is uh, less than 10 million years. This is very, how I mean, much it, how much it varies if we change the masses of the stars? They evolve fast, yes? Yeah, yeah they, 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 these are massive stars, so they evolve fast, you know, so this. To, to get to the first mass transfer, I don't remember, but it's uh, no, like a million year with these masses. And if you if you go even you know, to lower masses that make black holes, like 20 and something solar masses, then the, the time scale are, uh, may, may uh, extend to like 100 million years. But essentially, this time scale is small in relation to Hubble time. Uh, okay, so and then rates should follow star formation rates because then the, the, the delays, uh, the distribution of these delays is, has a uh, quite a steep uh, slope about minus one, but it starts at the you know, onset is uh, like 100 million after 100 million years after the star formation. So uh, then the second uh, options are globular clusters, which are dense stellar systems, 10 to 4, 10 to 7 solar masses. Stellar collisions are possible and very low escape velocities. And in these systems, you can have lots and lots of scenarios. So uh, I downloaded one possible where you, where you make a binary, massive uh, black hole binary. Uh, so masses can be much larger, can, can not much larger, larger than the uh, per instability uh, limit because you can have hierarchical mergers. Spins uh, should be random, and we expect that the spins on the average should be zero. Uh, so because the memory of the direction of the black hole spin is for, uh, forgotten, is lost in the exchange of partners. 
uh, rates should peak at higher redshift, where the, we believe the peak of globular cluster formation is about uh, the redshift of four. Uh, but uh, and the um, point is that uh, the amount of mass in the globular clusters now around our galaxy is about one percent of the mass. So. Uh, but the efficiency of making binary black holes in globular clusters is much higher than in the field because, I mean, you have a catalyst you, because you can uh, exchange partners and you tend to, black holes tend to sink toward the center of a globular cluster. So there is a lot of uh, ways to amplify the production of binary black holes above just the rate uh, in the uh, in the field. Uh, and initially, when the globular clusters were formed, the amount of mass in globular clusters was about 10% of the mass of the galaxy. So this 10% plus the amplification means that the rate from globular clusters can be comparable to the rate from the, from the field. Uh, so that's this uh, efficiency I defined the mm -hmm. parameter called the code. So it's number of binary black holes per, per unit solar mass of evolution. So then in, uh, in the field, uh, this goes roughly like that. Uh, and the higher the metallicity, the lower it goes. So we, the contribution goes mainly from the low metallicity uh, regions. For globular clusters, this uh, efficiency is a factor of five to or, or seven higher, and it doesn't depend that much uh, on the metallicity. So uh, this is uh, saying that globular clusters can uh, can contribute to, to, to the rate. Then there is the AGN disk model, where black holes are born in stellar evolution, but they are formed in binary black holes are formed in multi-body interactions in AGN disks and measures take take place in the disk. We expect the spins are isotropic, but because the amount of total matter that is contained in AGN disks is a fraction of total matter, uh, total stellar matter in all galaxies, is about 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5, the expected rates are very small. So I think that the top estimate of the rates in this model is about 1% of what can be uh, observed. And this was actually uh, sparked by one observation. I'll talk about it in a, in a moment. Now we have primordial binaries and masses correspond to phase transitions in the early universe. And in the literature, when I looked at it, they are generally be below one solar mass. Spins should be random and small. And the point, the, the, diff the difficulty here is once you make the black holes in the early universe by collapsing uh, some uh, regions be, be below horizon where there are huge uh, density fluctuations, then you still need to put them in binaries because they will not collapse and they will not be made in binaries. So uh, what people involved in this case is that they behave as if they, as if in globular clusters, but in the very early universe, or that later on, they, there is a lot of them in galactic halos, and they form binaries later on in the halos. And uh, so I think this first scenario does not work very well, but uh, the story is that rates do not have to follow star formation rate because this is completely unrelated process. Mm -hmm. And they are very uncertain, and they scale as the fraction of dark matter that is, cont that is contained in uh, in this type of objects. Uh, so let's compare what we know with observations. Uh, and uh, I start with basic rate arguments. So as I said, the formation must be really generic because the rate is pretty high. So exceptional environments like AGM disk are not favored because you cannot really uh, make up even with huge efficiency of formation of binary black holes when you have so little mass and you produce so little black holes. Even if you put all of them into binary black holes, that's not enough to make up for the rate. 
so then there are um, uh, regions like uh, cluster globular clusters or nuclear clusters can can contribute then uh, in the binary evolution scenario uh, when we talk about masses we see two heavy black holes so there is a problem for this scenario we cannot uh, explain masses above 65 solar masses uh, in this uh, scenario and we see such objects spins are slightly positive so that uh, agrees and i don't think that the small spins are a problem and the rates increase with redshift like they should but it's uh, it's not a proof of anything it's just a consistency check uh, because we just see we don't see enough range in redshift to to really, really compare that for the cluster evolution, uh, masses extend above this per instability supernova gap, which is okay because we can have hierarchical mergers. But there is one thing that if we have hierarchical mergers, super, then black holes made in mergers must have larger spins. What is PPSN? That's per instability supernova. That's so. This is the the, the limit of 65, 70 solar masses to uh, black hole masses. Uh, so the in hierarchical mergers, the spins of components that come from the merger should be uh, roughly 0.7. And there is in the data a little bit uh, evidence that spins for higher masses mergers are larger than for the low mass ones. Rates should increase, but follow star formation rate, and it would be nice to see how does the rate in you know behave at redshift one to four. But for that, we will have to wait for future generation uh, experiments. For AGN model, uh, it was kind of sparked by this event, which is uh, followed by a quasar flare after 35 days in the same location. And uh, there is a possibility of forming a rare eccentric high mass binaries uh, in, uh, in this scenario. But as I said, rates are very low in my opinion. So maybe it's like, you know, one in a hundred objects and that's just one in a hundred detection. So everything fits, but this is, this is not the generic scenario. But isn't this source where the black hole was uh, heavy as uh, 130 solar mass? Uh, no, that's not the one. Not this one. I don't think so. I, but I have to. The know. most massive. No, that's not the most massive. No. Then for the primordial, uh, okay, the distribution of masses. Uh, I mean, we don't have very good predictions for the distribution of masses of primordial black holes. But one thing we know that for the primordial black holes, there is no lower limit. And uh, there might be uh, black holes even below uh, one solar mass, but they are difficult to detect, even if they were in binaries, the range for them, the sensitivity is low. Spins are positive, uh, so that's, uh, the, the, and spins are small, and in this scenario we expect spins to be very small, but spins are positive uh, on the average. Uh, so that doesn't um, fit. Uh, and then the question is, why do the rates follow star formation rate? So, if, you know, if they, if, there is, if they do, there may be some rates conspiracy why this model, uh, which, this, in this model, the, the rate uh, would follow something, you know, was completely unrelated. But I think that the main uh, problem for this model is coming from observations that limit the fraction of dark matter that is in compact objects. So on the left-hand side, we see uh, the limits for the uh, compact objects, uh, for the fraction of compact objects as a, in, in dark matter halo of our galaxy coming from uh, gravitational lensing. And we see that for the mass range that we are interested in, it's about less than 10 to minus two. So less than 1% of mass in the halo can be in uh, black holes with the mass of 10 solar masses. If you look at the limits from X-ray 
uh, glow. These are these limits. Uh, these are the limits based on the fact that if we had a lot of black holes in the halo, uh, they would be accreting gas and they would provide X-ray glow. And we don't, we have a limit on the X-ray glow that they would have provided. And these limits tell us that the fraction of uh, black holes in dark matter halo is less than uh, 10 to minus three. And the rates, as I said, scale as this fraction squared. So uh, that means that the models that assumed uh, a large fraction uh, of uh, the, the dark matter is made of black holes have to be scaled down by a factor of 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 6. And with this, uh, it's just impossible to get the observed rate. So I think that this model uh, cannot account for the observed uh, population. Uh, so, yeah. This uh, doesn't really, really, really work. So to sum this all, uh, that's my uh, summary slide. Uh, for the binary model, uh, we have um, uh, masses, and I give yellow light to the masses, not red, because uh, most masses we do explain, but we have this high mass tail that we cannot explain. Spins are fine, the rates are fine. For the cluster model, masses are okay. We can go to higher masses easily, and the distribution is exponential because so we don't do not expect a lot of these high mass uh, objects. Uh, for the spins, I give the um, yellow light because uh, I think that we can have a um, subpopulation coming from this model, for and the, the rates are fine. And for the primordial masses. I give a green light because I don't really know what the expectations are, but uh, so so I'm uh, trying to be uh, not to be restrictive, but I give yellow light for the spins for the same reason as in the in the clusters, mm -hmm. but the red light for uh, for the rates, which means that I think that. In the end, we should see a mix of these two models, and not, not, none of the models can explain the population that we see. Okay. So, thank you. <laughs> Gravitational wave detectors, sensitive as they are, they still have a threshold, right? They do not detect gravitational wave below some level. Yes. Below. Does it affect the models that you pre you are presenting? Okay. The fact that you don't know so much below that threshold. Do you mean the threshold in sensitivity or yeah. the threshold, threshold in sensitivity? I mean, the threshold in sensitivity, uh, well, there is always a threshold in sensitivity. Sure. And here we take this into account because we know uh -huh. that the, uh, there is a different range or different sensitivity for mergers with different chirp masses. We know the scaling and we can model that and we can model the sensitivity of, to, to, to the populations. So for double neutron stars, for low mass mergers, we see up to about 100 megaparsecs, but the massive ones, uh, the, we can see up to two gigaparsecs. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the selection effects are, you know, once they are known, they, they can be taken into account. Mm -hmm. But the other selection effect, the other threshold that I think is uh, more challenging is the frequency threshold. The higher the mass and the higher the redshift, the lower they go in frequency. Mm -hmm. Because you know we, we observe, uh, so uh, we are now starting to see this so-called uh, intermediate mass black holes, so black holes with masses uh, of the order of 100 solar masses and higher, but we see them only by the very uh, small part of the merger that enters the detector sensitivity range at low frequencies. So that's the problem, and I think this is uh, this will be a big challenge to achieve, to get to. But, you know, the sensitivity here is important to get to higher redshifts and at least to see what the rate density is as a function of, of, of redshift, which is very important for the model. Okay, thank you. Uh,
I have two questions. Um, one of them is you mentioned that the primordial uh, black holes should be formed similarly uh, as uh, other clusters in the or the universe. Mm, uh, uh, I mean, primordial they are black hole binaries. Binaries. Because single black holes, you you'll make by collapsing some stuff under the horizon in the early universe, but then you need to pair them. Yes, I understand, but this means that you need a high density uh, black holes. scenario where you're forming not this, this pair of black holes, but also probably other things, like say stars and... No, 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 no. It's, it, it just, uh, what I meant is that if you have high density of them, you need the black holes to skim one another, and when they skim at the right uh, separation, they can uh, emit quite a lot of energy in gravitational waves and become bound. But then the the, the, the problem is that the, once you, you, you form such a system, it has a pretty short merger time. Okay, so and my second question is more naive, uh, because it's not in the field. So you just mentioned that there's a, um, a difficulty in measuring uh, mergers uh, Above 100 solar masses. Um, have, you ever, have you ever been able to detect uh, mergers between uh, supermassive black holes? No, no, no. I mean, supermassive black holes will merge uh, at very low frequencies. Mm -hmm. So, because you know, in gravitational waves, everything scales with mass. So, but uh, we have an indication of the glow of uh, mergers or binaries of supermassive black holes, but that's done with pulsar timing arrays. And there was an announcement last year about this uh, correlated red noise, which indicates, it's not a detection yet, but it indicates that uh, there is a glow of uh, or background of supermassive black hole uh, gravitational radiation. Thank you very much, Malek. Uh, so first of all, I'm also happy to see that you agree that uh, these whole scenarios are not mutually exclusive. Nature has no obligation to be lame and simple for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is the following. Given what you have said, I can see that, of course, there are plenty of thinking goes into modeling this and getting some kind of numbers out. Uh, what you would need, what, is the, what would be the most constraining uh, of these parameters, given the prospect of future, I mean, I don't know Lisa, but let's take what you got. It seems that rates, many for my models, looks a, a very good, maybe telltale, but uh, can you think where you can push the observations? I think train? we, uh, I, I think that ma masses, and masses and spins. This is, uh, you know, if we have the distribution of, you know, masses and uh, spins versus masses, uh, and especially going to higher masses, mm -hmm. that's going to tell us uh, a lot. But we also need to, you know, uh, binary evolution uh, has uh, a lot of uh, interesting things, and we need to be, be sure that we understand uh, what we see. Uh, so, but so, so I think from but here the only clues will be from spins and masses. I you know it would be wonderful to see host galaxies. But I think that uh, that's not a really uh, promising avenue for two reasons. One is that we haven't seen, the, you know, we, 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 can, we haven't been able to identify even one uh, host galaxy for any binary black hole merger. And we know one host galaxy for a binary neutron star merger, which happened to be extremely close and we were extremely fortunate to see it. So uh, to repeat that, we may have to wait for, uh, for a while. Right, because the, because of the spin version, the, the sorry, chip version that the, the yeah, yeah. Is, but uh, less is still coming, so maybe this convolution. No, no, I think that the the, 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 the reason why we don't see the host galaxy is the huge, you know, localization errors, mm -hmm. and uh, that you know, for binary black holes, I mean, there are scenarios to make electromagnetic radiation, but the more radiation you make, the less likely it is, and I think these scenarios are generally uh, quite unlikely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I believe that if I am correct, uh, one of the predictions for the primordial black holes is that you can produce black holes of masses smaller than from stellar evolution. Yes. 
-hmm. Is there a way to rule out this uh, bio? Yes. Like so one one thing is how can you mm -hmm. finish? How can you differentiate from them being neutron stars if they are the same okay. matter? Uh, so, uh, when you have a merger of two neutron stars, some of the binary energy goes into deformation of a neutron star because neutron star has a radius and it will be tidally deformed and that takes energy and this energy then is not available for the gravitational waves so this will modify the waveform and these waveforms will be different then in the spiral phase. And then in the post-merger phase, you know, when, if we see post-merger uh, new, neutron star, then we see either, we have to see first uh, a semi-stable rotation of a neutron star that is about to collapse, or we see a formation of a black hole, but with black ho two black holes, it's a clean process where you, we, we have only vacuum and we'll just see newly formed black hole and its uh, oscillations after the merger. In other words, it's rather clear to detect the subject rather than rule out of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that, that's the usual thing. You don't detect sub, well, one, let's say one solar mass black holes for a long time doesn't mean they don't exist. You, see you can, I mean, that's always, that you, you, you place upper limits on their density. Just trying to find yeah. out if there are ways to put red light there and the masses from other black holes. Well, uh, in order to put a red light here, you have to have a model that you can trust. Yeah. And I think the point is that in order to, first of all, in order to make you know, 10, 20, 30 solar mass black holes, you have to make them very late in the history of the universe. Most of the models that are reliable will make uh, the black holes in much lower uh, mass range. Uh, but you know, I'm allowing for the freedom because I don't really know about this model. So that's why I give a green light. But if I have a model, then we can change the color. Okay, I have a question mm -hmm. about this AGN uh, scenario. So uh, it's something new for me. Okay. Uh, so where does it fit here? First of well, all, uh, AGN with the binary. Well, the, the AGN is a part of the cluster. Cluster. Mm -hmm. But uh, with uh, extremely low rates. Low rates, but it, it works like a stellar cluster. This yeah, there is a, there is, it's, it's a disc. Yeah, yeah, there is a disc, and the gas of this also contains stars. Yeah, but yeah, but this and, is not a cluster to know like. Yeah, but the, and the stars can uh, interact because they are relatively dense. Mm -hmm. So these are the outskirts of the AGN, yeah, mm -hmm. where the stars. Yeah, so the outer disk, no, not yeah. the inner disk, which we no, no, no. are studying. Mm -hmm. right. No, but in, in the context of the outer disk, it was discussed mm -hmm. for many years, physical and deep, for example, mm -hmm. that, but mm -hmm. not in the context of gravitational waves. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I also have a question. How difficult is it to measure precisely the direction of, uh, of a binary black hole merger? Because it's, it, it, it's the general of everything else. Okay, so uh, <laughs> it's uh, you, you have to have the, I mean, uh, you can measure the luminosity distance uh, if you have the location in the sky and an estimate of the polarization, so orientation. With three detectors, you can have that. And the basic idea for measuring the luminosity distance is that these sources are essentially standard candles because the amount of energy emitted in gravitational waves is proportional to the total mass. It's a certain fraction of the total mass. And the time scale is also proportional to the mass. So when you divide the two, you cancel the mass and the typical luminosity is 10 to 56 ergs per second. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, and therefore, if you have standard candles, you have luminosity distance. If you assume cosmology, you have uh, the redshift. So it's indirectly taken from the luminosity distance. Yeah, but uh, then, you know, if you have, if you measure redshift of chilled mass, so chilled mass times one plus z, uh, and if you can break this degeneracy, if you get, you know, assume cosmology and no luminosity distance, then you know Z and you know the chirp mass. If you have another handle on the chirp mass, then you can get uh, the Z 
uh, independently. And another thing is that you know this location in the sky is actually uh, an elongated banana-like shape. So you can do what you can do is count all the galaxies that are in there oh, that you can detect, and then uh, measure the redshift in a like statistical way, assuming that each of the galaxies can be the whole galaxy with the color of the Yeah, so we can uh, keep on. <laughs> Well, if I have to wrap up the discussion, let me just ask if there is any question on the Zoom. No. no. Mm -hmm. If yes, then speak up. If not, mm -hmm. then <laughs> let me thank the speaker.